Welcome to episode 121 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we learn how a poor beggar boy outsmarts a beggar woman, several trolls, and a king to win his heart's desire in the story of The Blue Belt. Once on a time, there was an old beggar woman who had gone out to beg. She had a little lad with her, and when she had got her bag full, she struck across the hills towards her own home. So when they had gone a bit up the hillside, they came upon a little blue belt, which lay where two paths met. And the lad asked the old beggar woman's leave to pick it up. No, said she, maybe there's witchcraft in it. And so with threats, she forced him to follow her. But when they had gone a bit further, the lad said he must turn aside a moment out of the road. And meanwhile, the beggar woman sat down on a tree stump. But the lad was a long time gone. For as soon as he had got so far into the wood that the beggar woman could not see him, he ran off to where the belt lay, took it up, tied it around his waist, and lo, he felt as strong as if he could lift the whole hill. When he got back, the old beggar woman was in a great rage and wanted to know what he had been doing all that while. You don't care how much time you waste, and yet you know the night is drawing on, and we must cross the hill before it is dark. Soon they tramped, but when they had got about halfway, the old beggar woman grew weary and said she must rest under a bush. Dear lady, said the lad, might I just go up to the top of this high crag while you rest and try and see if I can't sign of folks hereabouts? Yes, he might do that. So when he had got to the top, he saw a light shining from the north. So he ran down and he told his old beggar woman, we must get on, we are near a house, for I see a bright light shining quite close to us in the north. Then she rose and shouldered her bag and set off to sea, but they hadn't gone far before there stood a steep spur of the hill right across their path. Just as I thought, said the old woman. Now we can't go a step farther. A pretty bed we shall have here. But the lad took the bag under one arm and the old woman under the other and ran straight up the steep crag with them. Now... Don't you see? Don't you see that we are close to a house? Don't you see that bright light? But the old woman said there were no Christian folk but trolls, for she was at home in all that forest, far and near, and knew there was not a living soul in it, until you were well over the ridge and had come down on the other side. But they went on, and in a little while they came to a great house which was all painted red. "'What's the good?' said the old woman. "'We daren't go in there, for there's trolls live there.' "'Don't say so. We must go in. "'There must be men where the light shines so,' said the lad. "'So he, in he went, and the old woman after him. "'But he had scarce opened the door before she swooned away. "'For there she saw a great stout man, at least Twenty feet high, sitting on the bench. Good evening, grandfather, said the lad. Well, here I've sat three hundred years, said the man who sat on the bench, and no one has ever come and called me grandfather before. Then the lad sat down by the old man's side and began to talk to him as if they had been old friends. But what's come over the old woman, said the man. After they had chatted for a while, I think she swooned away. You had better look after her. So the lad went and took hold of the old beggar woman and dragged her up the hall along the floor. That brought her to herself, and she kicked and she scratched and she flung herself about and at last sat down upon a heap of firewood in the corner. But she was so frightened that she scarce dared to look him in the face. After a while, the lad asked if they could spend the night there. Yes, to be sure, said the man. So they went on talking again, but the lad soon got hungry and wanted to know if they could get food as well as lodging. Of course, 
said the man. That might be got too. And after he had sat a little longer, he rose up and threw six loads of dry pitch pine on the fire. This made the old hag still more afraid. Oh, now he's going to roast us alive, she said in the corner where she sat. And when the wood had burned down to glowing embers, up got the man and strode out of his house. Heaven bless and help us. What a stout heart you've got said the old beggar woman. Don't you see we've got ourselves amongst trolls? <laughs> Stuff and nonsense, said the lad. No harm if we have. In a little while, back came the man with an ox so fat and big, the lad had never seen its like. And he gave it one blow with his fist under the air, and down it fell, dead on the floor. When that was done, he took it up by all four legs and laid it on the glowing embers and turned it and twisted it about till it was burnt brown outside. After that, he went to a cupboard and took out a great silver dish and laid the ox on it. And the dish was so big that none of the ox hung over on any side. This he put on the table. And then he went down to the cellar and fetched a cask of wine knocked out the head and put the cask on the table together with two knives which were each six feet long when this was done he bade them go and sit down to supper and eat so they went the lad first and the old woman after but she began to whimper and wail and to wonder how she should ever use such knives but the lad seized one up and began to cut slices out of the thigh of the ox, which he placed before the old beggar woman. And when they had eaten a bit, he took up the cask with both hands and lifted it down to the floor. Then he told the old beggar woman to come and drink. But it was still so high, she couldn't reach up to it. So he caught her up and held her up to the edge of the cask while she drank. As for himself, he clambered up and hung down like a cat inside the cask while he drank. So when he had quenched his thirst, he took up the cask and put it back on the table and thanked the old man for a good meal and told the old beggar woman to come and thank him too. And I feared though she was, she dared to do nothing else but thank the man. Then the lad sat down again alongside the man and began to gossip. And after they had sat a while, the man said, Well, I must just go and get a bit of supper too. And so he went to the table and he ate up the whole ox, hooves and horns and all, and drained the cask to the last drop, and then went back and sat on the bench. As for beds, he said, I don't know what's to be done. I've only got one bed and a cradle, but we could get on pretty well if you would sleep in the cradle and then your dame might lay in the bed yonder. Thank you kindly. That'll do nicely, said the lad. And with that, he pulled off his clothes and lay down in the cradle. But to tell you the truth, it was quite as big as a four-poster. As for the old beggar woman, she had to follow the man who showed her to the bed though she was out of her wits for fear. Well, thought the lad to himself, it will never do to go to sleep yet. I'd best lie awake and listen how things go as the night wears on. So after a while, the man began to talk to the old dame, and at last he said, We two might live here so happily together, could we only be rid of this lad of yours? But do you know how to settle him? Is that what you're thinking of? said she. Nothing easier, said he. At any rate, he would try. He would just say he wished the old dame would stay and keep the house for him for a day or two, and then he would take the lad out with him up to the hill to quarry cornerstones and roll down a great rock on him, as this the lad lay and listened to. Next day, the troll for it was a troll as clear as day, asked if the old dame would stay and keep house for him a few days. And as the day went on, he took a great iron crowbar 
and asked the lad if he had a mind to go with him up to the hill and quarry a few cornerstones. With all his heart, he said, and went with him. And so after they had split a few stones, the troll wanted him to go down below and looked after cracks in the rock. And while he was doing this, the troll worked away and wearied himself with his crowbar till he moved a whole crag out of its bed, which came rolling down on the place where the lad was, but he held it up till he could get on one side and then let it roll. Oh, said the lad to the troll, now I see what you mean to do with me. You want to crush me to death, so just go down yourself and look after the cracks and refs in the rock, and I'll stand up above. The troll did not dare to do otherwise than the lad bade him, and the end of it was that the lad rolled down a great rock which fell upon the troll and broke one of his thighs. Well, you are in a sad plight, said the lad, as he strode down, lifted up the rock, and set the man free. After that, he had to put him on his back and carry him home, so he ran with him as fast as a horse, and shook him so that the troll screamed and screeched as if a knife were run into him. And when he got home, they had to put the troll to bed, and there he lay in a sad pickle. When the night wore on, the troll began to talk to the old dame again, and to wonder how ever they could be rid of the lad. Well, said the old dame, if you can't hit on a plan to get rid of him, I'm sure I can't. Let me see, said the troll. I've got twelve lions in a garden. If they could only get hold of the lad, they'd soon tear him to pieces. So the old dame said it would be easy enough to get him there. She would feign sickness and say she felt so poorly, nothing would do her any good but lion's milk. All that lad lay and listened to, and when he got up in the morning, the old beggar woman said she was worse than she looked, and she thought she would never be right again unless she could get some lion's milk. Then I'm afraid you'll be poorly a long time, said the lad, for I am sure I don't know where any of is to be got. Oh, oh, it's that be all, said the troll. There's no lack of lion's milk, if we only had a man to fetch it. And then he went on to say how his brother had a garden with twelve lions in it, and how the lad might have the key if he had a mind to milk the lions. So the lad took the key and a milking pail and strode off. When he unlocked the gate and got into the garden, there stood all the twelve lions on their hind paws, rampant and roaring at him. But the lad laid hold of the biggest and led him about by the forepaws and dashed him against the stocks and stones till there wasn't a bit of him left but the two paws. So when the rest saw that, they were so afraid that they crept up and lay at his feet like so many curs. After that, they followed him about wherever he went, and when he got home, they lay down outside the house with their forepaws on the door sill. Now, you'll soon be well, said the lad, when he went in, for here is the lion's milk. He had just milked a drop in the pail. But the troll, as he lay in bed, swore it was all a lie. He was sure the lad was not the man to milk lions. When the lad heard that, he forced the troll to get out of bed, threw open the door, and all the lions rose up and seized the troll, and at last the lad had to make them leave their hold. That night, the troll began to talk to the old dame again. I'm sure I can't tell how to put this lad out of the way. He is awfully strong. Can't you think of some way? No said the old dame. If you can't tell, I'm sure I can't. Well, said the troll, I have two brothers in a castle. They are twelve times as strong as I am, and that's why I was turned out and had to put up with this farm. They hold that castle, and round it there is an orchard with apples in it, and whoever eats those apples sleeps for three days and three nights. If we could only get the lad to go for the fruit, 
he wouldn't be able to keep from tasting the apples. And as soon as ever he fell asleep, my brothers would tear him in pieces. The old dame said she would feign to be sick and say she could never be herself again unless she tasted those apples, for she had set her heart on them. All this the lad lay and listened to. When the morning came, the old dame was so poorly that she couldn't utter a word but groans and sighs. She was sure she should never be well again, unless she had some of those apples that grew in the orchard near the castle where the man's brother lived. Only she had no one to send for them. Oh, the lad was ready to go that instant. But the eleven lions went with him. So when he came to the orchard, he climbed up into the apple tree and ate as many apples as he could. And he had scarce got down before he fell into a deep sleep. But the lions lay all around him in a ring. The third day came the troll's brothers, but they did not come in man's shape, came snorting like man-eating steeds, and wondered who it was that dared to be there, and said they would tear him to pieces so small that there should not be a bit of him left. But up rose the lions and tore the trolls into small pieces, so that the place looked as if a dung heap had been tossed about. And when they had finished the trolls, they lay down again. The lad did not wake till late in the afternoon, and when he got on his knees and rubbed the sleep out of his eyes, he began to wonder what had been going on when he saw the marks of the hoofs. But when he went towards the castle, a maiden looked out a window who had seen all that had happened, and she said, you may thank your stars you weren't in that tussle, else you must lost your life. What? I lose my life? No fear of that, I think, said the lad. So she begged him to come in, that she might talk with him, for she hadn't seen a Christian soul ever since she came there. But when she opened the door, the lions wanted to go in too, but she got so frightened that she began to scream, and so the lad let them lie outside. Then the two talked and talked. And the lad asked how it came that she, who was so lovely, could put up with those ugly trolls. She never wished it, she said. "'Twas quite against her will. They had seized her by force, and she was the king of Arabia's daughter. So they talked on. And at last she asked him what he would do, whether she should go back home or whether he would have her to wife. Of course he would have her, and she shouldn't go home. After that, they went round the castle, and at last they came to a great hall where the troll's two great swords hung high up on the wall. I wonder if you are the man enough to wield one of these, said the princess. Who, oh, I, said the lad, "'Twould be a pretty thing if I couldn't wield one of these. With that, he put two or three chairs, one atop the other, jumped up and touched the biggest sword with his fingertips, tossed it up in the air and caught it again by the hilt, leapt down, and at the same time dealt such a blow with it to the floor that it shook the whole hall. After he had thus got down, he thrust the sword under his arm and carried it about with him. So, when they had lived a little while in the castle, the princess thought she ought to go home to her parents and let them know what had become of her. So they loaded a ship, and she sailed from the castle. After she had gone and the lad had wandered about a little, he called to mind that he had been sent out on an errand thither, and had come to fetch something for the old beggar woman's health. And though he said to himself, after all, the old woman was not so bad, but she's all right by this time. Still, he thought he ought to go and see just how she was. So he went and found both the man and his dame quite fresh and hearty. What wretches you are to live in this beggarly hut, said the lad. Come with me up to my castle and you shall see what a fine fellow I am. Well. They were both ready to go, and on the way he, the beggar woman talked to him and asked how it was he'd got so strong. Well, 
If you must know, it came of that blue belt which was lay on the hillside that time when you and I were out begging, said the lad. Have you got it still? asked she. Yes, he had. It was tied round his waist. Might she see it? Yes, she might. And with that, he pulled open his waistcoat and shirt to show it to her. Then she seized it with both hands and tore it off and twisted it round her fist. Now, she cried, what shall I do with such a wretch as you? I'll just give you one blow and dash your brains out. Far too good a death for such a scamp, said the troll. No, let's burn out his eyes and then turn him adrift in a little boat. So they burned out his eyes and turned him adrift in spite of his prayers and tears. But as the boat drifted, the lion swam after and at last they lay hold of it and dragged it ashore on an island and placed the lad under a fir tree. They caught game for him, and they plucked the birds and made him a bed of down, but he was forced to eat his meat raw, and he was blind. At last, one day, the biggest lion was chasing a hare, which was blind, and straight over stock and stone. And the end was, it ran right up against a fir stump and tumbled head over heels across the field right into a spring. But lo, when it came out of the spring, it saw its way quite plain and so saved its life. So, so, thought the lion, and went and dragged the lad to the spring and dipped him over head and ears in it. So when he had got his sight again, he went down to the shore and made signs to the lions that they should all lie close together like a raft. Then he stood upon their backs while they swam with him to the mainland. When he had reached the shore, he went up into the birchen copse and made the lions lie quiet. Then he stole up to the castle like a thief to see if he couldn't lay hands on his belt. And when he got to the door, he peeped through the keyhole, and there he saw his belt hanging up over a door in the kitchen. So he crept softly in across the floor, for there was no one there. But as soon as he had hold of the belt, he began to kick and stamp about as though he were mad. Just then the old beggar woman came rushing out. Dear heart, my darling little boy, do give me the belt again, she said. Thank you kindly, said he. Now you shall have the doom you passed on me. And he fulfilled it on the spot. When the old troll heard that he came in and begged and prayed so prettily that he might not be smitten to death. Well, you may live, said the lad, but you shall undergo the same punishment you gave me. And so he burned out the troll's eyes and turned him adrift on the sea in a little boat but he had no lions to follow him. Now the lad was all alone, and he went about longing and longing for the princess. At last he could bear it no longer. He must set out to seek her. His heart was so bent on having her. So he loaded four ships and set sail for Arabia. For some time they had fair wind and fine weather, but after that they lay windbound under a rocky island. So the sailors went ashore and strolled about to spend the time, and there they found a huge egg, almost as big as a little house. So they began to knock it about with large stones, but after all, they couldn't crack the shell. Then the lad came up with his sword to see what all the noise was about, and when he saw the egg, he thought it a trifle to crack it. So he gave it one blow, and the egg split and out came a chicken as big as an elephant. <laughs> now we have done wrong, said the lad. This can cost us all our lives. And then he asked the sailors if their men were enough to sail to Arabia in four and twenty hours, if they had a fine breeze. Yes, they were good to do that, they said. So they set sail for the fine breeze and got to Arabia in three and twenty hours. As soon as they landed, the lad ordered all the sailors to go and bury themselves up to the eyes in a sand hill, so that they could barely see the ships. 
the lad and the captains climbed a high crag and sat down under a fir. In a little while came a great bird flying with an island in its claws, and it let it fall down on the fleet and sunk every ship. After it had done that, it flew up to the sand hill and flapped its wings so that the wind nearly took off the heads of the sailors, and it flew past the fir with such force that it turned the lad right about, but he was ready with his sword and gave the bird one blow and brought it down dead. After that, he went to the town where everyone was glad because the king had got his daughter back. But now the king had hidden her away somewhere himself and promised her hand as a reward to anyone who could find her. And this, though she was betrothed before. Now, as the lad went along, he met a man who had white bearskins for sale. So he bought one of the hides and put it on and asked one of the captains to take an iron chain and lead him about. And so he went into the town and began to play pranks. At last, the news came to the king's ears that there never had been such fun in the town before, for here was a white bear that danced and cut capers, just as it was bid. So a messenger came to say the bear must come to the castle at once, for the king wanted to see its tricks. So when it got to the castle, everyone was afraid, for such a beast they had never seen before. But the captain said there was no danger unless they laughed at it. They mustn't do that, else it would tear them to pieces. When the king heard that, he warned all the court not to laugh. But while the fun was going on, in came one of the king's maids and began to laugh and make game of the bear. And the bear flew at her and tore her so that there was scarce a rag of her left. Then all the court began to bewail, and the captain most of all. Stuff and nonsense, said the king. She's only a maid, besides it's more my affair than yours. When the show was over, it was late at night. It's no good you going away when it's so late, said the king. The bear had best sleep here. Perhaps it might sleep in the ingle by the kitchen fire, said the captain. Nay, said the king, it shall sleep up here and it shall have pillows and cushions to sleep on. So a whole heap of pillows and cushions was brought, and the captain had a bed in a side room. But at midnight, the king came with a lamp in his hand and a big bunch of keys and carried off the white bear. He passed along gallery after gallery through doors and rooms, upstairs and downstairs, till at last he came to a pier which ran out into the sea. Then the king began to pull and haul at posts and pins, this one up and that one down, till at last a little house floated up to the water's edge. There he kept his daughter, for she was so dear to him that he had hid her, so that no one could find her out. He left the white bear outside while he went in and told her how he had danced and played its pranks. She said she was afraid and dared not look at it. But she talked her over, saying there was no danger if she only wouldn't laugh. So they brought the bear in and locked the door, and it danced and played tricks. But just when the fun was at its height, the princess's maid began to laugh. Then the lad flew at her and tore it to bits, and the princess began to cry and sob. Stuff and nonsense, cried the king. All this fuss about a maid. I'll get you one just as good one again. But now I think the bear had best stay here till morning, for I don't care to have to go and lead it along all these galleries and stairs at this time of night. Well, said the princess, if he sleeps here, I'm sure I won't. But just then the bear curled itself up and lay down by the stove, and it was settled at last that the princess should sleep there too with a light burning. But as soon as the king had well gone, the white bear came and begged her to undo his collar. The princess was so scared she almost swooned away, but she felt about till she found the collar, and she had scarce undone it before the bear pulled his head off. Then she knew him again and was so glad there was no end to her joy 
and she wanted to tell her father at once that her deliverer was come. But the lad would not hear of it. He would earn her once more. So in the morning, when they heard the king rattling at the post outside, the lad drew on the hide and lay down by the stove. Well, has it lain still? the king asked. I should think so, said the princess. It hasn't so much as turned or stretched itself once. When they got up to the castle again, the king took the bear and led it away. Then the lad threw off the hide and went to the tailor and ordered clothes fit for a prince. And when they were fitted on, he went to the king and he said he wanted to find the princess. You're not the first who has wished the same thing, said the king. But they have all lost their lives, for if any one who tries, who can't find her in four and twenty hours, his life is forfeited. Yes, the lad knew all that. Still, he wished to try, and if he couldn't find her, twas his lookout. Now, in the castle there was a band that played sweet tunes, and there were fair maids to dance with, and so the lad danced away. When Twelve hours were gone, the king said, I pity you with all my heart. You're so poor a hand at seeking, you shall surely lose your life. Stuff, said the lad. While there's life, there's hope. So long as there's breath in the body, there's no fear. We have lots of time. And so he went on dancing till there was only one hour left. Then he said he would begin the search it's no use now, said the king. Time's up. Light your lamp out with your bunch of keys, said the lad, and follow me whither I wish to go. There is still a whole hour left. So the lad went the same way which the king had led him the night before, and he bade the king unlock door after door, and they came down to the pier which ran out into the sea. It's all no use, I tell you, said the king. Time's up, and this will only lead you right out into the sea. Still five minutes more, said the lad, as he pulled and pushed at the posts and pins, and the house floated up. Now's the time is up, bawled the king. Come hither, headsman, and take off his head. Nay, said the lad, stop a bit. There are still three minutes, out with the key, and let me get into this house. But there stood the king and fumbled with his keys to draw out the time. At last he said he hadn't any keys. Well, if you haven't, I have, said the lad, as he gave the door such a kick that it flew into splinters inwards on the floor. At the door the princess met him, and told her father that this was her deliverer, on whom her heart was set. So she had him, and this was how the beggar boy came to marry the daughter of the king of Arabia. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.